Greetings students and welcome back to my lecture series on quantum mechanics. I'm going to use this video to show you how to obtain the position and momentum of a quantum mechanical particle from the wave function. In the next video, I'm going to derive the Heisenberg uncertainty principle for position and momentum. So let's begin. Suppose that I have a particle that's described by its wave function, psi of x comma t, which I'm going to draw right over here. Recall that the wave function is related to the probability distribution of the particle. So if I wanted to calculate the probability that I'll find my particle between two points A and B, I could take the magnitude squared of that wave function and integrate it from A to B. This was all talked about in the previous video and I've linked that in the description. Now here's our first definition. The expectation value of the position x of the particle is given by the integral from negative infinity to infinity of x times the magnitude of psi squared dx. But what does this expectation value even represent? Well, I'll start by explaining what it doesn't represent. This expectation value does not represent the mean value we get from taking several consecutive measurements of the particle. Why? Well, if I take one measurement and get a value somewhere here that I'll call x1, then just by taking the measurement I've actually interfered with the system and collapsed the wave function to a delta function at x1. This phenomenon is called wave function collapse. So if I take repeated consecutive measurements of the position, I'll keep getting x1. And if I take the average of all those consecutive measurements, I'll still get x1, which may not necessarily be equal to the expectation value defined in this equation. So given the inevitability of wave function collapse, how do we determine what the expectation value of position represents? Well, suppose that we take several identical systems that have the exact same wave function psi. So we could have system 1, system 2, system 3, and so on. From this collection of identical systems, we then measure the position of the particle in each system at the exact same time. If we do that, we might get x1 for the first system, we might get x2 for the second, we might get x3 for the third, and you get the idea. Now if we take all these measurements from these n systems and average them, we'll end up with the expectation value of position. And this is what the expectation value of position represents. It represents a mean value of position found from taking single measurements of an infinite collection of identical particles or wave functions or systems. We could also find the expectation value by taking repeated measurements on only one system, but instead of taking repeated measurements while the wave function is collapsed, we could return the system to its original wave function between each measurement and then average a whole bunch of those measurements. It's functionally the same idea as taking measurements of an infinite collection of identical particles. So now that I've explained the meaning of the expectation value of x, let's now talk about the expectation value of p, or the momentum of the particle. Interestingly enough, we can actually derive this from the expectation value of x, so let's go over it. Let's start by taking the time derivative of the expectation value of x using equation 1. I can go ahead and move the derivative inside the integral where it becomes a partial derivative. And since this small x here is just a scalar and doesn't actually represent the particle position, it doesn't depend on time. So I can take it out of the derivative expression as a constant. I'm going to now change the psi squared term to a psi conjugate times psi. And now if you recall the previous video where we proved that the normalization of a wave function stays preserved with time, we actually computed the time derivative inside this integral. And it turned out to be psi conjugate times i h bar over 2m times the second derivative of psi with respect to x minus psi times i h bar over 2m times the second derivative of the conjugate of psi with respect to x. Now, if you look at both of these terms, they both have i h bar over 2m, which means that we can take out the i h bar over 2m as a common factor, and this is what we will end up with. Now, let's take this term in square brackets to the side and try to work on it a bit more. 
I'm going to start by adding the derivative of psi conjugate times the derivative of psi and then subtracting the exact same term. So on aggregate, I've just added zero. Let's now go ahead and rearrange the order of these terms. And once we do that, notice that the first two terms look like the derivative of the product of psi conjugate and d psi dx, while the second two terms look like the derivative of the product of psi and d psi conjugate dx. So this whole expression is actually equal to the derivative of psi conjugate times d psi dx minus psi times d psi conjugate dx. So now we'll go ahead and plug this simplified expression back into the integral that we left off at. We'd still like to keep simplifying this integral and we'll do that using something called integration by parts. My first function in the integration by parts will be this x and my second function will be everything else. So my integral becomes the first function x times the integral of the derivative of this function inside minus the integral of the integral of the derivative of the function inside times the derivative of x which is just one. Now the integral of the derivative of a function becomes the function itself. So after simplifying, here's what we'll get. Now recall that the wave function psi has to be normalized in order to be a physical solution because psi has to be related to a probability density function. And because psi has to be normalized, the integral of its magnitude squared from negative infinity to infinity has to be equal to one. And because this integral is finite, both psi and its conjugate must approach zero at negative infinity and positive infinity. So as a result, this first boundary term cancels because it contains psi and psi conjugate, which means that we're left with something more simple. We're not done yet. Let's do a very quick integration by parts on just the second term, using the psi conjugate expression as the second function and the psi as the first function. Again, when we do the integration by parts, the boundary term disappears because of normalization. And if we plug the rest of what's left back in, we'll find that the rate of change of the expectation value of position after simplifying becomes negative ih bar over m times the integral from negative infinity to infinity of psi conjugate times d psi dx. Let's discuss the significance of this expression. The derivative in time of the expectation value of position denotes the rate of change of the expectation value of position of the particle. In other words, it's the velocity of the expectation value of x. But this is not necessarily the same as the expectation value of the velocity, at least until we've proven it. However, I'm going to have to ask you to suspend disbelief and just accept that the velocity of the expectation value is the same as the expectation value of the velocity. So we can write this down in the form of this equation. But bear in mind that the subscript x on the velocity says that it's the velocity in the x direction. Now usually in quantum mechanics, we prefer to work with the momentum instead of the velocity. So the expectation value of momentum would then be the mass times the expectation value of velocity, kind of like how p equals mv in classical mechanics. So if I plug in the integral in place of the expectation value of velocity, here's what I'll get. The m's will cancel, and I can multiply and divide the numerator and denominator by i, the square root of negative one to finally obtain the formula for determining the expectation value of momentum. And I'm gonna call this equation two. Now let's go way back up and bring in the expression for the expectation value of x down here as well. Because x and px represent physical observables, they must correspond to Hermitian operators as per the second postulate of quantum mechanics that I mentioned in another video, links in the description. Because x and px are operators, their expectation values with respect to a state vector or wave function psi are given by the following formulas for operator expectation values that we also covered in a previous video. Because psi is already normalized by the normalization condition, the inner product of psi with itself is just one. So I can get rid of these denominators because they're both equal to one. 
Now, the reason I've gone back to operators here is that I actually like to determine the expression for the position operator x hat and the momentum operator p x hat. And in order to determine those operators, I'm going to use the inner products given by these integrals up here and convert them to a form that's similar to what's shown in this bracket notation, in this Dirac notation. In order to do that, I need to stick all the extra stuff in both of these integrals in between the bra, which is the conjugate of psi over here, and the ket, which is psi itself. And if I do that, I'll find that my position operator is just the scalar x, and that my momentum operator is h bar over i times the derivative with respect to x. Now why do I care so much about position and momentum specifically? Why not some other pair of quantities? Well, there's two reasons. One reason is that position and momentum are found in the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which I'm actually going to derive in the next video. The second reason is that almost all classical mechanics quantities can be expressed in terms of position and momentum. For instance, kinetic energy is half mv squared, which can also be written in terms of momentum as p squared over 2m. The same idea applies to angular momentum, potential energy, and so on. So in general, we can find the expectation value of almost any classical mechanics quantity Q by using the operators x hat and p hat in this equation. And that's why x hat and p hat are important. And that should do it for the video. In the next lesson, we're going to discuss and derive the Heisenberg uncertainty principle for position and momentum. I'll finish off by thanking the following patrons for supporting me at the $5 level or higher. I've linked my Patreon account in the description so you can check it out if you want. So that's it. If you enjoyed the video, feel free to like and subscribe. This is the Faculty of Khan, signing out.